My name is Jamie Price. I was the visual effects supervisor on Downsizing, and I'm going to take you through a bit of the history of the miniaturization of people in movies. One of the first primary uses of visual effects to shrink people was in the movie The Bride of Frankenstein in 1935. In order to blend the big people and the small people together, two pieces of footage had to be shot. First, there was a background plate featuring Dr. Pretorius in his lab, and then there were additional shots made of the people that would be shrunk down and placed into the jars. Measurements were taken on set, and then those measurements were scaled up, and the people who were meant to be small were photographed from a much larger distance, and therefore they looked smaller in the frame. And early on in the 30s, before the advent of blue screen technology, there weren't that many options for compositing images like this together. It was created using composites done by the Williams process, which was a process where people were shot against black, and the brightness could be then used to create an outline of the character, what we call a mat, and then those characters were composited into the live-action background. In 1940, Dr. Cyclops was being done, and that was in color. And the Williams process wasn't really suitable for color, and so a lot of the solutions in Dr. Cyclops were to use rear projection. The background projection image was big, the people in the foreground appeared small, and in the final shot, you saw the mix of the scales. Another thing that's really interesting about Dr. Cyclops is some of the creativity that they used to have the interaction between the big people and small people. You see a mechanical oversized hand that an actor is grasped by, and the camera is lined up with that oversized hand and the rear projection screen to create the illusion of the continuous body of Dr. Cyclops. Dr. Cyclops also introduces the idea of a cat threatening some small people. And it's interesting to note in this sequence the difference in the look of the shots between when they're photographing the small people on oversized sets and when they're photographing the cat against a real set. What's at play here is the idea of depth of field. And depth of field is the amount of frame that's in focus. And so if you look at the coverage of this scene, you'll see that when photographing the cat, the camera is close and the background is very blurry, but when photographing the people, the camera is farther away, but it results in the two halves of the scene have a kind of fundamentally different look. And it may not be something that you notice at first right away, but there's something subtle that's giving away that the two sides of the scene were shot in different ways. 1957, The Incredible Shrinking Man. Now the depth of field is more controlled. But what's interesting about this scene, also involving a cat, the focus is deeper and it's a better match to the shots that uh, are showing Grant Williams. And so you begin to feel that the scene is becoming more of a whole. 1959, Darby O'Gill and the Little People. What they did was make extensive use of force perspective. Force perspective is creating the illusion of something being small by placing it far away from the camera and photographing it at the same time as something close so that when the two subjects share the frame at the same time, one looks much smaller than the other. This required a lot of light. The story is that they got every light in Hollywood and used them to photograph these scenes. They placed one actor on a set piece that was scaled up and artfully blended so that when the camera was lined up just perfectly, it looked like it was part of the foreground set. Another interesting and old technique that was used was something called the Schuften shot. And the Schuften shot involves using a mirror where a portion of the reflective coating is scratched away, revealing just clear glass. When you shoot the mirror, you look through a portion of it and you look at a reflection in the other portion. And by placing the object either through the clear glass or in the reflection, much farther away, you create the illusion of two images being blended together. This was a technique that was used in the 30s as early as films like Metropolis. It wasn't really until the advent of digital technology that new techniques started to be utilized. Hook in 1991 used some of the similar techniques, composites and blue screen, in order to create a miniature look of Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell was also combined with photographic elements for her wings that were actual miniatures and had the proper small scale that were photographed separately and then composited with her. 1995 brought Indian in the cupboard. They really made an effort to honor the optical principles of photography when photographing something small. And that means that they really studied 
the depth of field, and the optical properties of the lenses. When you look at some of the shots, you see the backgrounds are quite out of focus, and that's because they're really going for this look to make the foreground character look small. Another technique that was used is motion control. Motion control is a system where a robotic camera is moved that matches its own movement the same way every single time, and that way multiple elements can be shot and combined, and they won't appear to be moving against each other because the camera has made the exact same move every time thanks to the electronics and the robotics and the gears. Lord of the Rings, 2003, the culmination of all of the techniques that we've been talking about. Force perspective, compositing, digital technology were all being utilized to create the mix of scales in this movie. One interesting advance in Lord of the Rings was the use of motion control to actually create force perspective with a moving camera. In the early days, if the camera was not in exactly the right place, the gag would be given away and the shot wouldn't work anymore. This was accomplished by placing one actor at a certain distance from the camera, another Another actor at a farther distance from the camera and then as the camera moved the actor in the distance would also move so that they appeared to be constantly the same distance. Ant-Man 2015. In order to achieve the realism level in Ant-Man, special sets were built and photographed with a still camera and a library was created of images for each of these small scale sets. That allowed the filmmakers to then recreate those sets digitally and compose whatever shot they wanted from whatever angle they wanted and with whatever depth of field that they wanted. That brings us to downsizing, 2017. Alexander Payne didn't move the camera very much and he didn't cut very often, which meant that the shots were subject to a very, very high level of scrutiny. All of our measurements had to be extremely precise or the audience would tell over the course of the shot that the perspective wasn't quite right or the lighting wasn't quite right. So we really were incredibly meticulous with our notes, with duplicating our environments. One of the techniques that we decided not to use was the idea of oversized props and sets. We felt in looking back at the the earlier work as good as it was, there was always something about the detail level that gave it away. However, one of the things that we knew we needed was the actual interaction for the actor and the lighting interaction of being in a set. We used one of the oldest techniques in motion pictures, and that's rotoscoping. Rotoscoping is where the outline of a character is traced frame by frame so that that character can then be taken out of whatever background they're in and placed into another one. We actually did build oversized sets, but we knew we were never going to use those sets in the final image. They were just there for the actor to have something to work with and for the cinematographer to be able to light. One of the things that changes when you're photographing something big or small is the relationship of the size of the subject to the size of the light. So as the subject gets smaller, the light relative to them gets bigger. And that meant we had to have very large light sources. Then the actor was rotoscoped out and then composited into the background. And that's what appears in the final movie. I think what's most exciting about the trajectory that visual effects technology has taken is how much freedom filmmakers have now. There are a lot fewer limitations being placed on filmmakers because of technology and because of visual effects, and that allows their imagination to really take flight. Wow, that is wild, isn't it? It's just wild.